In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Trinity Sunday. In the Episcopal Church, we always know when Easter is over from the very first words in the liturgy. Instead of Alleluia, Christ is risen, uh, the Lord is risen indeed, which we've had for quite a long season of Easter, we have instead, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. And we will begin the liturgy this way from now until the end of the church year. But it's especially appropriate today as we celebrate Trinity Sunday. A priest asked one of his confirmands, what is the Trinity? A young, the young lady answered in a very weak voice, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I didn't understand, said the priest. She said, you're not supposed to. It's a mystery, and you get the joke. That's the, that's the funny part. She learned her lessons well, and so have you. Trinity marks, as Trinity Sunday marks the beginning of the second half of the church year, and in, in beginning this way, Trinity Sunday puts everything we've experienced in the first half of the year into perspective. During the first half of the year, Sunday after Sunday, we focused on the earthly life of our Lord Jesus, beginning with preparing for his birth, going all the way through uh, his death, resurrection, ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And now, uh, all, of, all that we have experienced once again in that first part of the year is wrapped up and put within the context of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, as we just sang. A fully developed doctrine of the Trinity isn't found in Holy Scripture, but it is implied in Scripture. For example, in today's reading from the letter of St. Paul to the church at Rome, he says, Right at the beginning of the reading, we have peace with God, and he means God the Father, but he didn't explain that. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. That statement basically equates God with Jesus Christ. And later in that same paragraph, at the end of the reading, St. Paul says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us, equating the Holy Spirit with God. It took a few hundred years for the church to develop its doctrine of the Trinity. Because, well, absolutely central to the Christian faith Going back to Abraham is that God is one. Our Lord and all of his disciples were accustomed to reciting, not once a week, but every day, every day. Deuteronomy 6, 4, known as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Central to the faith. Yet Jesus taught and acted not just like any other rabbi, but as God himself. He claimed an authority that belonged only to God, and he did things that only God can do. He also had a strong relationship with God the Father. Immediately after the resurrection, the followers of Jesus began thinking of him and relating to him as God. They still said the Shema, and they definitely still believed that God is one, and yet they began 
to pray to God the Father through God the Son, Jesus. A third distinct spiritual reality was also such a strong reality that he was seen as divine as well. He, of course, is the Holy Spirit. So in the early church, starting with the church of the New Testament, we have these Christian monotheists speaking of and praying to three distinct divine persons. How would the church finally come to grips with this paradox? Have the Christians in reality become tritheists rather than monotheists? Well, that question was dealt with decisively in A.D. 325 at Nicaea in what is today known as Turkey. The bishops of the church gathered to deal with various questions of a theological nature, and this was one of them. Is there only one God or three? There still is only one God, and so the creed that they devised at that council begins right at the very beginning, I believe in one God, or we've put it, we believe in one God. And then it deals with the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How can there be one God and yet three persons? The young confirmand was right. It's a mystery. It's rooted in the difference between humanity and God. Let's take an example. We certainly can understand the concept of independence. We like to think of ourselves as independent. Though when you get right down to it, no one here is completely independent. Did you raise your own food? If you did, did you supply your own seed for planting? Did you build your own home with your own hands? And if you did, did you cut your own trees for the wood in your home and make your own lumber? Every one of us is connected to so many others in so many ways that while I can say that I am one person, I can also say that I'm inseparably connected to a larger society that ultimately includes the whole human race. I am a person but I'm also a part of a unity called humanity. Anybody know what the Earth's pop population is? Anybody want to venture? I looked it up. <laughs> it's eight billion, eight billion. One humanity, eight billion persons. No man is an island entire of itself, says John Donne. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Yet humanity is not united, is it? Russia continues its horrible war against Ukraine. Christians in North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Yemen, Iran, Nigeria, and India, to name just the 10 worst persecutors, Christians in these countries are being killed for no other reason than that they will not deny Christ. We're divided in this country as a people in many ways. Let's bring it down more locally. There's always someone in the office that you, few can get along with. And families 
continue to be torn by strife of one form or another. E pluribus unum, out of many, one, is a nice motto, but no one takes it literally. People are too imperfect, too disunited for us ever to be able to take such a sentiment literally. But why is it even an ideal? As disunited as the church is, in Tampa, how many different denominations are there? Hundreds, maybe thousands. As disunited as the church is, why does St. Paul insist on calling it a body? Even giving it the honor of calling it the body of Christ. We can conceive of a greater unity because we have experienced unity at some level and can therefore visualize the ideal. We may be fortunate enough to experience it at home with our spouse and children. We experience a sense of unity in our life here at St. John's. We may recall times in history in this country when everyone really did pull together for the common good. It feels so good when people are united, when we experience true unity in the sense of out of many, one. Because when we're at unity with one another, we are closer to the people God has created us to be. God in his very being is the uniting of the persons of God into such perfect harmony that they truly are one. The Trinity is only a mystery to us because of our fallen nature. As we immerse ourselves more and more in the love of God, and that's what the life of the church is supposed to be, immersing ourselves in that love of God, we become more unified with others and reflect more and more the very nature of God. God is love. We know that God does not need anything to fulfill his nature. And thus God must have within himself not only the ability to love, but also an object for his love. The persons of the Trinity are the very source of love, the source and foundation of all unity. That source of love is revealed to us most fully in our Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The persons of the Trinity are so perfectly united through love that they are indeed of one substance. Out of this wellspring of love, God has caused all things to be. And whenever and wherever love and unity exist, God is present and revealed. Amen.